Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Pastor Rob Johnson from Servant's Heart Worship Center in Columbia, Tennessee. Once again, thanking you for checking out our YouTube channel and going to our Facebook page and liking us. And if you know, if, if you have a friend or you know somebody that really needs a word from the Lord, maybe send them one of these messages or direct them to our website at servantsheartworshipcenter.com. Because a lot of times people can be suffering and when we're spiritually in a ditch or there's something going on in our life, it's very important to have a, have a church family or a Christian friend to lean on. So don't just be a digital friend, be a literal friend. God called us to be the church. Let's just not do church, let's be the church. In today's message, I'm calling it the wind gate because the, all through the Bible, gates are mentioned. You have gates in heaven, gates in hell, gates at the city, gates of, in the temple. And it's very important for us to realize that we are the gatekeepers for, for the spiritual gates in our life. The eye gate, the ear gate, what we allow in and out is very important to our spiritual maturity. And we have to be a good gatekeeper. The church, the first generation of the church in the book of Acts, Something happened that was very powerful, and it's needed today in today's church. And that was when the Holy Spirit was poured up, out upon them with the sound of a mighty rushing wind. So get your Bibles, grab a cup of coffee, and dig into this word as we talk about the wind gate. God bless you. How many have ever been to California? <laughs> in Southern California, there's something called the wind gate. A lot of us are from California. And there's, a, there's an east wind that comes from the high desert, and it blows from east to west. And it blows, and there's a, 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 the mountain range just kind of curves and creates this channel in the topography and when the east wind from the high desert blows, it blows through this opening, this channel, and it blows into LA and out to, to the ocean. And I used to love it when I was a kid because the east wind was always warm and it was really steady and strong and we'd go out and we'd play in the east wind. But that area in the topography is called the wind gate. So that's what the Lord put on my heart to preach about this morning. Because we as believers, we have a wind gate in our life. In Southern California, the air pollution got so bad that in 1987, they called experts literally from all over the world to come in and examine it and to try to figure out what they could do to curb and to get rid of the air pollution because they'd already mandated all the factories and, and construction and everything. So there were safety and air quality districts and control boards put into place, but it wasn't working. Their best efforts didn't seem to work. So the state of California brought in these experts from all over the world and they did a 10 year study from 87 to 97 about how best to get rid of the pollution. They spent 10 years and over $200 million studying the problem. And I'll never forget the day that they called the press conference together and they said, okay, it's all these experts, a whole panel of them. And they, all the news media were there and they, they say, we've got our studies complete. We've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is, is we figured out exactly what's happening. We know why it's happening. The bad news is, is we don't know how to fix it. They said that the only time in their study that the air in the LA area, that includes the valley, was free from pollution was when the east wind would blow through that wind gate and it would blow the pollution out to sea. So they said, and I quote, the solution to this problem is out of the hands of man. 
because it takes a continual and consistent wind blowing through that wind gate to blow the pollution out of LA and out to the ocean. They said because Los Angeles is a coastal city, the air is heavy and damp, so the pollution normally would go up into the atmosphere or blow out to sea, but it would get trapped in this heavy, thick, damp air and just kind of hover over everything. And they said it would take a miracle, a continual and consistent wind blowing from the east to keep the pollution out. That'll preach. That'll preach. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Acts. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to read the first four verses. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Father God, for your Holy Spirit. Filling us, guiding us, directing our lives. Speak to us now. Through these words of life. And as we partake of this bread... Father, I pray that the seed go deep into our hearts. Take root and bear fruit. We thank you again for your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 says this. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a windstorm, a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. On the day of Pentecost, The Holy Spirit came in the form of what sounded like a mighty windstorm that blew in from the eastern gate of heaven. And it filled the upper room where God's people were gathered in one accord. It filled the place where they were gathered in one accord. This is very important. That's why God waited 50 days. Because in that 50 days... A lot of the people that thought they were followers of Jesus, that loved to watch his miracles and follow him around and hear his words, when they saw him crucified, and then when they heard that he had risen again, a lot of them wouldn't believe it, and they left. But there was a remnant of 120 believers left that gathered together in unity, in one accord, in the upper room, when God opened up the wind gate and sent his Holy Spirit into that place. And I believe that the purpose or part of the purpose of God doing that was because God's people at that time had become polluted. Do you realize that for 400 years, from the end of the Old Testament period to the beginning of the New Testament period, over 400 years, God was silent. For 400 years, people lived and died, God's people, without a word from God. Not a prophet, not a book, not a letter. And why was that? I believe it's because the same thing that was happening in the L.A. basin was happening to the church. And when I say the church, I'm talking about God's people. Pollution had set in to the hearts of God's people. And it had made a home in their heart. And they began to lose their true love for God. So God stopped speaking to them. For 400 years, the pollution of sin and iniquity had so set in to the hearts of God's people at that time, it had overtaken them. Their sacrifices, 
were polluted. Their praise and their worship had become polluted. Everything about them was, spiritually speaking, was polluted. There was no power in anything they did. And you've got to remember the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament, the same God of today. And God, through the Old Testament, brought his people through amazing and crazy obstacles and experiences with supernatural power. And they lost their yearning for him. They fell out of love with God because they allowed the pollution of sin to take them over. Their religion had been reduced to just merely going through the rituals, going through the motions. And the religious leaders at that time were particularly bad. Most of them were only in it for the money. They were in it for the title and the prestige and the glory that came with the position. And they were only interested in acting holy and righteous and being spiritual on the outside. That's why Jesus called them hypocrites. And when Jesus spoke of them, because all those years, those 400 years, up until the time Jesus came, the hearts of man was in the exact same position. So when Jesus came, he came into a world where the church, where the priests were corrupt and the church itself was corrupt. Excuse me. <clears throat> but there was a time when these men of God truly had a heart for worship. Sometime, Mark, in your Bible, go home and read Amos 5, and you'll see kind of the digression of God's people. Because he said to the people, God said through the prophet, I hate your church services. I hate your solemn assemblies. He said, away with the noise of your music. Your polluted worship. What God was telling them is that they were still going through the motions. In fact, the music was getting louder and the crowds were getting bigger, but the spirit in their heart was getting smaller. And Jesus called them out on it. He called them hypocrites. He said that on the outside, they look good, but on the inside where it really counts, they were nothing more than dead man's bones. And their religion and their rituals had nothing to do with actually making a connection to God. But there was an earlier time in their life when their sacrifices and their worship was pure and it was from the heart. But over time... They changed, and as you read the end of the Old Testament, as you read and you watch what happens to the nation of Israel, as it starts on this downslide, you'll can, you can see the things that polluted their worship. They became increasingly social conscious. They wanted to be more like other nations. At one point, they demanded a king but they increasingly became more social conscious and they began bending and bowing to the whims of the culture. They became culturally minded. They started allowing false gods to be brought into the temple of the Lord and worshiped there. Can you imagine that? They started renting out space in the, in the church to, to store sacrifices to false gods in the house of the Lord, in the temple of the Lord. And it polluted the church. Church leaders began allowing secondhand sacrifices to be laid upon the holy altar of God. Sacrifice that had already been used and offered to other idols and false gods. This is why I don't rewrite secular songs and put worship music to it. There was a trend in the 80s. Hey man, let's turn peaceful, easy feeling into a Christian song. 
Let's turn this secular song into a, into a Christian song. And to me, something troubled me in my spirit whenever I heard somebody say that because the Holy Spirit was welling up in me saying, no, that song has already been offered to a false god, to the god of this world. It's a secular song. I don't want second-hand worship. So many times we give God what's left. When God demands the worship of our life to be 24-7, He commands us, He tells us, to live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Yet we keep jumping in and out of it like it's some sort of a vehicle. There's some awesome, crazy worship out there where thousands of voices and huge churches get together and they worship the Lord and they jump around and they praise. And I say, great, as long as that worship carries them past the parking lot. Because so many times we go into the house of the Lord, we get all hopped up on what we think is worship, and by the time we get down to the stop sign, it's gone. You see? Second-hand worship. And this is what was happening to the church in that 400 years. Their worship had become completely polluted. And God stopped talking to them for 400 years. How many know that God will leave you alone. I look around this room and I know because I'm ministering to certain people and I could see the seats where they sat. I could see their chairs. I can hear their voices. I could see their smiles. And right now, they're in the spiritual turmoil of a lifetime because they began to allow things into their temple. Strange fire. They allowed things into their life that polluted their spiritual life. God will leave us to our own devices. But you know what? 400 and some odd years go by. And then Jesus sends us His only begotten Son. I mean, God sends us His only begotten Son. And His name is Jesus Christ. And He comes to dwell among us. And He came to save the world. And for 30 years, Jesus listened and prayed and listened to God the Father. And was led and taught by God the Father before He even started His ministry. Jesus had prepared Himself, His mind, for the task. And he came into the world, and the condition of the church was the same as it had been for 400 years. It was polluted with superficial religion, with no heart for God. And what was needed at that time to get rid of the spiritual pollution in the church, Jesus brought. Because it was the same thing that was needed to get rid of the pollution in L.A. For that wind gate from the east to open up and for God's Holy Spirit to blow through the church and sweep out the superficial religion, sweep out things like idolatry, things like pride, egos. Because at that time, that was running rampant in the church of God. Idolatry and everything else that had polluted at the church at that time. The Holy Spirit of God, Jesus came. He bled and He died and He rose again. He ascended into glory. He sent His Holy Spirit with the sound of a mighty rushing wind for the same purpose. Whew, to blow through the church and clean out the iniquity. Our first scripture shows that that's exactly what He did on the day of Pentecost. The wind gate was opened up. And the Holy Spirit came in like a windstorm. But I want you to notice that the Holy Spirit of God, yeah, it cleaned some things out, but it also blew some things in. And this is the same thing that will happen to you and I today. The Holy Spirit came in and it swept out the old dead, dry religion of just going through the motions, but it blew in a joy in spirit. It blew in a power and anointing from God and it changed the hearts of all who received the Holy Spirit. Their lives were never the same again. That windstorm blew into Peter's life and it blew out the, the timidity and the fear that he had, hiding ashamed, guilt, condemnation, plagued his life 
because he had denied Jesus three times. And the third time, Jesus looked straight at him. That had to have broken Peter's heart. It sure enough put a chinker in his spirit. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit blew through, it cleaned out all that iniquity that Peter was holding, all that pollution that he was holding inside his spirit. The Holy Spirit blew that away, and it blew in some things too. It blew in an anointing and a power in Peter, and it gave him words of life. As God breathed the breath of the Holy Spirit into Peter, it blew in words of life. And Peter, who was once hiding in timidity a few hours before, stands up before the whole crowd, and he speaks those words of life. He says, the stone which the builders had rejected. He's talking about Jesus. God has now made the cornerstone. And here we go. There is no other name whereby we can be saved but by the name of Jesus Christ. The timidity and the fear in Peter and the other believers was gone for good because a windstorm blew into their life when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The thing about air pollution is, it leaves its mark on everything it comes in contact with. If you don't believe me, next time you go to LA, just take a look around. There's a brown film on everything. All the buildings, all the trees, everything. I've seen them install brand new shiny guardrails along the freeway that gleamed in the sunlight and reflected the sunlight. And after a few weeks, maybe a month, they were dulled down. The gleam was gone. It would not reflect the sun anymore because pollution had settled on it and covered it with a dingy film that prevented the sun's light from reflecting off of it. Do you see where I'm going here? This is the same thing that happens in the life of believers, when we allow the spiritual pollution of secret sin and things that we try to hold on to and think God's okay with, and we'll go join ourselves together with others who think God's okay with it. God's okay if I do these drugs. It's natural. God grew it. Why can't I smoke it? God grew the grapes. Why can't I drink? We justify things in our life. Dozens and dozens of things. When we're affected by the pollution of sin, because it, refle it, re it prevents the light of God re from reflecting in, off of us, or out of us. Amen? Can you see that? It prevents the sun's light, S-O-N's light, from reflecting off of us and out of us. And you know what? The church today, and when I say the church, I'm talking about the body of Christ, Christians. I, use that, I always say the church. When I'm talking about the Old Testament, I know people say, Pastor Rob, you know, the church didn't come in until the book of Acts. I know that. But I, when I say the church, I'm talking about God's people. That's what I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about denominations or mega churches or whatever. But there's people sitting in churches, buildings. God's people are sitting in churches everywhere whose spiritual life has been affected and covered with the dingy film of pollution, of spiritual pollution, of hidden sin. And they're sitting there and, and there's, there's nothing wrong. They come in and they're going to church. They're, they're trying to do what God is you know, speaking for them to do. And they've been doing what they've been doing for years, going through the motions. But there's something a little different about them. A lot of these people I knew and I remembered and saw when they were on fire for God, when it was new, when blessings were happening in their life and they were praising the Lord. But now I look at them and they're still here. They're still coming. They can still quote scripture. I still see them pray, but there's something different about them. There's a dingy film that covers their life. There's a dullness in their desire for worship. There's a, a dullness in their praise. There's, a, there's a, a dingy film over the things of God in their life, and it's easy for me to see. And there's a dingy film over their witness. And Brother Dean, that's the worst one. 
Because when there's a dingy film over your witness, two things happen. One, it stops God's light from shining through you or off of you. And it stops you from even caring that it's happening to you. I don't care. This is the beginning of a trip down into the valley. And most people, if they don't get help, they'll end up at rock bottom. Amen? How many have seen it happen? But I want to say that the solution to this problem, this pollution, spiritual pollution in our lives, is that same miracle-working, supernatural windstorm that happened on the day of Pentecost. Can I get an amen on that? The, the Holy Spirit that blew in from the eastern gate, that blew in through the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And if we allow God's Holy Spirit to sweep through our lives, He will sweep away your addiction. But you know what? We have to open the wind gate. We have to open the wind gate. The Bible says that we are gatekeepers. That our body is a temple. And when you research gatekeepers in the Bible, it was a very important position. They were very selective. Only men of character could become a gatekeeper. And our bodies are now the temple. We have an eye gate, an ear gate, a mouth gate, and we have a wind gate. God is not going to push himself on you. We have to open the wind gate and say, come Holy Spirit, blow into my life once again and sweep out the pollution that's making me a spiritual dullard. You and I are in charge of the wind gate. Can I get an amen on that? And God will come in and He'll blow out that pollution and He'll blow back into you that freedom and that joy and that power and that anointing that you once had back when you were on fire for God. And once again, you'll be able to feel Him in your life and you'll be able to continue to move and live in the Spirit as God breathes new life into your life. Just like he, somebody mentioned in Sunday school, just like God breathed into man on the day of creation, when he created man, he breathed the life into him. And just like Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to do with you and I. Amen? Ezekiel 37 tells us about the valley of dry bones. I've preached on that before. When God gave Ezekiel a vision of a valley filled with dead, old, dead, dry bones that were scattered, laying lifeless all over the desert floor. And God asked him a question. God said, son of man, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel said, well, Lord, only you know. Look what God said back to Ezekiel. Look at his response to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37, 9. This is how God responded to the question. Can these bones live again? Well, Lord, you know. And God says, then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds, Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So the bones were dead. The bones were dry. They were divided and scattered. Doesn't that kind of sound like a picture of the church as a whole today? There's a lot of dead churches, dry churches. We're divided most churches aren't united. We're divided up into denominations and, and, and belief systems and all these things. God's people are divided and they're scattered all over the place. And it's because we've been operating for too long under our own superficial power instead of operating in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. 
when the church becomes too culturally minded, when we start be, uh, caring about what society says, when preachers stand in pulpits and they start being timid about preaching that certain lifestyles are a sin and that these things are not pleasing unto the Lord, when we stand and we say that, it rubs people the wrong way so people have stopped saying it. We're doing exactly what God's people did in the Old Testament when God went silent for 400 years. We're bending, we're becoming culturally minded, and we're bending to the whims of society. Can you see that happening? We need to be operating under the blood covering and by the power of the Holy Spirit instead of operating and continuing to operate in this vain spirit of entertainment and cool you ever get a flyer from a church in the mail? It's like, how cool are we, right? Every church just wants to say how cool they are. The speakers, you know, they just want to be cool. You know what I'm saying? There's something we want to capture. And I'm all for being open and, and having anybody come in to the house of God. But if we do it at the expense of the pure word of God and the truth as written... If we omit certain things, so we'll continue to grow. If we preach differently to certain demographics than we would normally, then we've become too culturally minded. We need to stop yielding to the vain spirit of entertainment. Preachers need to stop preaching self-help philosophies. And church bodies got, has to stop bending to this politically correct psycho babble. It doesn't matter what political party you affiliate with. We're Christians and it's time for Christians to unite. We've been divided and scattered for too long. It's bad enough to have a dead church and a dry church, but what's even worse is to have a divided church. Can I get an amen on that? So as Christians, we need to unite together, all Christians everywhere, come together, stand united, and take the church back. Yes. Amen. Take it back. How do we do that? Let's do exactly what God told Ezekiel to do. Let's speak a prophetic message over to it. Let's say, come, O breath of the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies, these spiritually dead bodies, so that they may live once again. Come, Holy Spirit, and move through your house again. Let us open up the wind gate so that God can blow in and cleanse the world out of the church and revive us. Like I said earlier, the condition of the church is a direct reflection of the condition of we as individuals. People will get spiritually dry, disoriented. They wander down into the valley. And if we're not there to go and try to help pull them back, and sometimes you yank them back up a couple of feet, and they jer jerk loose of you, and they go down another 10, and you yank them up another three, and they shake loose of you, sometimes you just got to let them go. But you got to try. We have got to try. We've got blind, spiritually blind people that are wandering toward a cliff. And the church is sitting back saying, well, we can't say anything to them because we don't want to insult them. They're dying! It's what we learned on Wednesday night, just a few weeks back, in that video teaching that we were watching. So they wander down, disoriented. They get to the rock bottom of the valley floor, and that's usually where they spiritually die. And that's where a lot of people give up because they cannot believe they've messed up so bad. They cannot believe that there's any way that God will bring them back on their feet again. But I want to say that there is a solution. Let's look at our brothers and sisters who are stumbling a little bit and let's speak a prophetic message over their life. Let's speak it how it should be. Let's not say, hey, poor Joe Blow over there, man. I'm glad I'm not like him. What happened to that guy? And then get in our cars and go home and never call him or seek him out. Let's speak a prophetic message over God in the name of Jesus. I speak a blessing over his life, over her life, over their life. 
God, bring blessing into their life. Let them find you again. Come, oh Holy Spirit. Open up that wind gate. Let them open that thing back up and you can blow through their lives. Bring them back to you. As you read through Ezekiel 37, it says that the wind began to blow after he asked, God asked him that question. The we. The wind began to blow and, it blow, and it says that Ezekiel heard a noise. I love that. The bones began to rattle. We're talking a whole valley floor filled with bones, separated, scattered, dry, dead. The bones began to rattle and move. And he, they be, as they began to quiver, they came up off the ground. And Ezekiel saw all the bones that came up off the ground and began to move. And God brought them back together in order, in their right order. Every bone found its counterpart. And God restored the bones back together again in the right order. And all at once, the Bible says He made them a mighty army. But before they became an army, it says that He brought them back together in the right order. He brought them back together and made each individual person whole again. Then he united all of the restored whole people and he brought them together as an army in the army of God. God will fix you first and then he'll make you part of the army. But he's going to restore you first. This gives every one of us hope. Amen? Because we may think that God doesn't work this way anymore, but He sure enough does. Because if you speak a, a, a prophetic message to the Lord and you open up that wind gate in your life, if you have been corrupted with political, or I mean with, uh, uh, see, political corruption, that was a Freudian slip. If you've been corrupted with spiritual pollution in your life, you open that wind gate and the Holy Spirit will blow into you and He will put your divided and scattered life back together again and you'll get back on your feet again and breathe new life into you even when man says it's impossible just like those la experts even when the experts say hey we've done all we can do it's out of our hands there's nothing we can do maybe you've had a marriage or counselor saying hey i've done all i can do in this marriage i can't do any more Maybe you've heard another counselor or a psychologist or somebody or a pastor, somebody saying, I've done all I can do. If you've got a doctor's report and the doctor tells you, I'm sorry, I've done all I can do, don't lose hope. Speak a prophetic message to the wind. Oh Lord, restore my life bring back i open the wind gate bring back your holy spirit father i need a healing i need a spiritual healing a financial healing a physical healing whatever it is open that wind gate back up and speak a prophetic message to the wind meaning speak it as though it were and god will set you on your feet again As the elders come and we prepare for our communion table, I just want to say a couple things real quick while they're preparing. I was watching a documentary on SpaceX. Anybody like space stuff? I just love it. I love space stuff. I'm addicted to it. I just, I'm silly for it. I can't, get, I can't get enough of it. And I was watching this documentary on SpaceX, and, and it's... Uh, the guy that owns it, you know, he owns, he created the, that electric car, uh, what are they called? The uh, Teslas, thank you. And he developed this, a, this, this business called SpaceX, and they invent all kinds of stuff. They're the ones that are sending most of the satellites into space these days. And he is creating something called an ion engine. He was talking about solar winds. Has anybody ever heard of a solar wind? What a solar wind is, is a giant burst of energy coming from a flare up, a solar flare coming from the sun. And they've invented this vehicle that they've sent into space and it's got a type of a sail on it. And as the solar winds 
uh, blow ionic radiation. These, these sails collect the particles and they convert them into energy. And that energy propels that vehicle through space. It's called a collector. And the ion engine, they say, is going to be the future of space travel. That we will not need any fuel from Earth to power a vehicle in space. And it will go at speeds never imagined. It will continually gain momentum. And that reminded me so much from the wind of the sun, the S-O-N. The wind of the sun, that spiritual solar wind, those bursts of energy that God blows into your life. If we got our sails up, our sails are our hands lifted in praise, even when everything in our life is tanking, we've got our sails up. We will collect. God will convert that praise into spiritual energy and propel us through our life and through eternity. And we won't need any fuel that this world has to offer. We won't need any hyped up worship to get us through a few hours on Sunday. We will have continual power and we will go at speed spiritually never imagined. You may think of something that would take more, take a few years in your life to do on your own. And God will do it in a matter of days, weeks, minutes. When your sails are up and we collect the energy from the S-O-N and God converts that into spiritual power and propels us through space and time. This church is a perfect example of that. Start a church from scratch and then within a couple of years be in your own building and only God can do that. We just need to make sure that we've got our sails up. One more scripture, John 3, 8. This is what John said about the Holy Spirit. The wind, John's talking about the Holy Spirit. John 3, 8. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So you cannot explain how people are born of the Spirit. John's talking about the Holy Spirit of God, the wind from the sun, the S-O-N. And when it blows, it blows wherever it wants. In other words, hear this, we've got to go where He takes us. It's like a sail on a boat. We've got to go where He takes us. He's not going to go where we try to pull him. We have to generate power from the Holy Spirit and be like a sail and let him take us where he wants us to go. The main thing I want us to remember as the gentlemen begin passing the elements I want us to remember that we're the gatekeepers. It's up to us. We are free moral agents. We have to open the gate. And when we do, God will fill us with his Holy Spirit. On the night that Jesus was arrested, he gathered together with his disciples and he said, this is going to be the last time until we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb that I'm going to break bread with you. And there was one among them with a polluted heart. There was one among them who had allowed the sin of greed and ego to creep into his heart. And he's the one 
that Jesus leaned in and said, go do what you got to do. Be quick about it. Sometimes God will let us go. He let me go. But praise the Lord. When I hit my knees and I said, I got to come back. Like the prodigal son in the slop. I came to myself, Lord, I can't do this. I got to come back. Thank you. And like that prodigal son, he ran to me. And he opened his arms and he embraced me. We all have the elements. As Brother Leland always tells us that the Bible says, before we do this, this is not a ritual. To a lot of people it is. But to us as true believers, this is not a ritual. Make sure that your heart is right with God before you do this. We are breaking bread in remembrance of Jesus.